so uh, today's session is unusual because this is a crossover seminar between two fantastic different network pluses, um, the TFI, so the Transforming Foundation Industries Network Plus, and the UK CCSRC. And the inspiration behind today's event was all about the importance and the driving and the drivers um, about sustainability in transforming the foundation industries being that core component and the reality that CCS is unavoidable as part of that transformation towards sustainability or what I'd like to think of as circularity. Um, so that was kind of the big motivation behind having today's webinar was to get these communities together and talking. Um, it's been a long time that the power sector has certainly been deeply, deeply engaged with CCS but industry hasn't had that same type of relationship and we wanna make it something that continues to grow. So today, as you can see, um, we've invited this um, some panelists today where they're gonna introduce themselves and I will, so I will introduce them through my short introduction to give you a bit of an idea of where they're coming from and how they fit into the industry decarbonization Pro, um, sort of problem that we have, particularly focusing on the need for carbon capture. And so I'll be doing that. And what I hope is that throughout hearing their brief introductions, you'll start to have questions and ideas and thoughts. And please don't hesitate to pop those into the chat, either directly to me, to Karis, who's uh, managing everything behind the scenes with Mel, um, or just generally. And what we'll be doing is we can use those as part of our kickoff to our discussion session in the second half. And that's really the thing that we're looking forward to today is having a really exciting, engaging discussion about how we can all work together to transform foundation industries using CCS. So with that, I have a few slides to introduce um, because I do know that today we've got a, a different community with us talking about the issues around um, the issues around us. And so traditionally in our webinars, we wouldn't be introducing the UK CCSRC, but today it seems like a really important thing because we've got lots of people joining us who aren't familiar with our organization. So our mission at the UK CCSRC is to ensure that carbon capture and storage plays an effective role in helping the UK achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And we've got lots of sort of ideas behind that and lots of um, sort of sub goals, if you will. But from perspective of today's audience, we're talking about competitive net zero industries in the UK. And we're talking about controllable net zero and net negative GHG electricity suppliers. All the points you see below are other important initiatives which are closely linked, but those today are two of the big points that I wanted to address. So our remit is that is, is defined here. And what I think is most important to share is that we've been around since 2012 and we continue to go from strength to strength in terms of our ability to foster engagement, research, collaboration throughout the UK um, in CCS research. And one of the things that we um, have a pillar in terms of our growth and our plans is the link between us and industry. We're very conscious that we need to continue to develop that link and we need to continue to align our research with the various needs um, that are driven by everything from environmental to economic. So that's kind of where we stand. And so for those of you who are sort of thinking, where do we sit in the big picture? If you think about the reality, sustainability has CCS as a core component. And so if you think about the power stream that's coming in and your feedstocks, CCS can be part of fuel and feedstock upgrades. And I think that's where a lot of people think the CO2 capture and storage, I see it's all slid to the side, we can all still read it, but CO2 capture and storage can play a huge role, right, in that. But what's often ignored is the fact that CO2 capture and storage can also play roles in other aspects of industrial processes. And I think that's what's starting to come out and become really important in terms of how industry is gonna make itself sustainable and how CCS existing and developing and future technologies can engage. And that includes things like process and product design upgrades as well. And so that's where CO2 capture and storage can make a difference. Now, at this stage, Today, I can't provide you with an entire background on everything that we can, that CO2 capture and storage can do, but what I want to do is point you to the website, which is on the screen, which is the UK CCSRC's website, which has an incredible array of seminars 
um, which you can watch about targeted topics, particularly the Net Zero Seminar resources, so you can learn about a lot of the specific technologies, some of which you might hear mentioned today. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you want to learn more about them. So <clears throat> if we think about this big picture, and I've taken this um, schematic from the decarbonization options for the Dutch ceramic industry publication, um, which was commissioned um, and produced by TNO, um, is they highlight that the changes are not just single thing, right? We're not just changing one thing. We've got a range of different ways in which we can see CO2 reduction. And so this is where the UK CCSRC, if we think about it, um, can be engaged in so many of these pivotal points, but not just the UK CCSRC, CCS researchers throughout the country. And that includes our core areas of carbon capture, storage systems and policy, but also includes re realities that we have a lot of researchers who are doing work around adapting, modifying, designing processes, working on residual energy challenges, working on managing and recycling and new feedstocks. So we're a holistic organization which sees the problem and we're looking forward to integrating better with industry um, from below, I don't know, TRL minus one probably on up. We are, um, so where I wanna sort of lead us into is the challenges that I see going forward. Um, in terms of why we're having the seminar today and the panelists. So the reality is, is that we have a logistical challenge. We have the clustered and the non-clustered. And so for those of you who are familiar with IDRIC, IDRIC is focused on clustered industries. And the challenge we've got is the enormous number of our industrial, our industri industry in the UK is not clustered. And a lot of them are small and medium or intermittent emitters. So lots of different complexities. And so these are challenges that we face and we need, to look for, we need to look for solutions working together. The second challenge I see is supporting the energy demands industries require, particularly the large ones um, and helping them to successfully decarbonize the energy they use, um, but recognizing the challenges it poses. And then we've got the variety of CO2 capture needs, which I alluded to before. And what this really means is that there isn't one solution. There's no one size fits all. The reality is it's about choosing the right solutions for the right for the situations. And so this pre presents a much more complex scenario for the uh, foundation industries, because even if we start to divide you into your sort of six sectors, it doesn't mean there's one solution for all, everybody in cement or everybody in ceramics. And so this is where it takes some nuance and understanding and discussion to help work that out. And the last thing that I would point out is the willingness to think about the short, medium and long-term changing solutions. So today's panel, I think is gonna reflect on all these points and I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say myself. Please again, um, don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat as you think of them. And again, that we'll use those to kick off our discussion in the second half of today's uh, conversation. So with that, on today's panel, we're going to go ahead and get started with Bruce Adderley from UK, UKRI. Bruce, are you ready to go? I'm indeed ready to go. I shall just close up my slides. Uh, can I get it to share? Where is it? Oh, there we go. Right, hopefully we're set. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Bruce Adderley, um, and I'm uh, the Challenge Director for the Transforming Foundation Industries um, ISCF Challenge. Um, many of you from the CCS side may well be more familiar with um, the Industrial Decarbonization Industrial Decarbonization Challenge, run by my fellow Challenge Director Bryony. Um, and we have a close relationship between Brian and myself, because we've known each other for, for years, um, and, and our teams talk to each other on a regular basis, really trying to make sure that nothing falls down the gaps, having had, having put together silos of foundation industries and in, industrial decarbonisation. So today I really want to pick up from um, what uh, Kira has been saying, and that there's one key thing that I'll come to at the end, um, which is about that how, although in theory, foundation industries, yeah, they've got lots of things in common, lots of things are very different, and you need lots of different solutions. So I will, I will definitely touch on that in, in a few minutes. 
Um, I have got some introductory slides now for the challenge. So apologies to those of you who are very familiar with the Transforming Foundation Industries Challenge through the TFI Network Plus, uh, but you will have seen this all before, uh, but I won't take too long over it, um, just to give some background. So foundation industries, as we define them, um, are ceramics, glass, cement, metals, paper, and the one that I can't see because it's hidden, chemicals. And when I mean chemicals, principally we're talking about bulk chemicals, the sort of chemicals um, that are handed on to another company and then they go and make final products. Together, they are a huge sector for the UK economy, both in terms of turnover um, and the number of people that they employ directly and through their supply chains. But the challenge is, is here because exactly what Kira said, uh, we have a huge emissions issue and the common intensive nature of them means that it's been very hard so far to significantly address their decarbonisation challenge. So what have we set out to do? So our mission statement talks about transforming the foundation industries, but what I highlight from um, the, the vision statement for and the mission statement for the uh, UK CCSRC, that also includes the word competitive. And competitive is a very significant element of, of what we're about. It really is about helping the UK foundation industries to remain and continue to be um, competitive on an international basis so that they form a large part of our economy over the future years through 2050 and I assume well, well beyond. As a challenge, we've had these five um, objectives right from the start. I'll let you read through them rather than me repeat them. Um, but then the next slide, we're going to talk about some of the interventions that we put in place to help make these objectives a reality. So this is an overall summary um, of the challenge and essentially where we fit. We fit along the TRL scale between university-led research and base programmes. And indeed, the scope of what we cover in terms of technology and the fact that we principally uh, focus on energy efficiency and resource efficiency is partly bounded by, for instance, what base programmes were running at the time that we got the challenge started. So for instance, they were very focused on fuel switching, and obviously there is also the IDC challenge, very focused on CCS and hydrogen. So it wouldn't be appropriate for us um, to address those uh, aspects directly. But of course, there's an awful lot of overlap at the edges. Um, and there's a lot of self-supporting innovation work that needs to be done. So the challenge, we've invested in a large scale collaborative R&D programme. We've also invested in new pilot facilities, uh, principally for the glass sector, because they lacked those. Um, but those facilities that will be coming to fruition at St Helens within the next year to 18 months will be of use across the foundation industries because, of course, we'll be able to look at general things to do with furnaces, control systems, materials, um, resource efficiency, all these sorts of things. Of course, the Network Plus is very much part of what we set out. We knew we needed to gather together academics in the foundation industry space in the UK so that they could collaborate and start to kick off new avenues of research. So that's an, an overall summary. Um, we've made great strides so far. We have 60 to 70 collaborative R&D projects either running or some have recently completed. So there's an awful lot going on. Now, to come back to the main point I want to add into um, the beginning of our discussion today, uh, and I hope we'll come back to it considerably later. If we just take um, the work done by the CCC um, and their main scenario, you'll have all seen this chart before, it would be very, very familiar to you. Um, and we're all quite familiar that CCS and hydrogen and electrification have a large part to play through to 2050 in terms of decarbonising the industrial and construction sectors. But there's been a tendency, particularly from the policy side and therefore on the policy support side, to ignore some of the thinner slices at the top of those charts. The things that are focusing on um, energy efficiency, resource efficiency, reducing material consumption. But the reality is, is that when you start to look at those as a whole, and this is my final slide, what we actually find is this pie chart. 
If we sum up the contributions in this CCC scenario through from now to 2050, in terms of how much CO2 reduction is meant to be delivered in this scenario, and I know a scenario is only just that, it's not the way the world will actually turn out to be, but it's a, it's a useful indicator for us, I think. If we look at that, we find actually that very simplistically, there's essentially four quarters to this pie chart. So I include BEX with CCS. And then if we take electrification, hydrogen, and the resource and energy efficiency space, it becomes very clear that there are four main avenues um, that the foundation industries are going to need to look at in terms of their options for decarbonisation. And it's very clear that CCS is very much uh, a big one of those and has a significant part to play. But I think we have to recognise that every region, um, every company and every site within every company will be making different choices depending on the situation and the policy landscape that they find themselves in, in terms of which of these technologies are going to be deploying. And I will leave it there and look forward to the question and answer session shortly. Thank you so much, Bruce. That was a really great way to kick it off. I think um, the CCS sort of side who may be attending today got a better picture of some of the industrial challenges. And of course, on the flip side, I think a good reminder for everybody in the industrial side, the importance of CCS. Um, so I'm going to ask Paul if he's ready to come on. Paul, are you going to share your own slides and unmute yourself? Right, I'm going to unmute myself, but um, this is literally the first time I've used this computer uh, to do a presentation. So, of course, it is now not allowing me to share advanced. Would you like me to share, Paul? Uh, yeah, that might actually work. Apologies for that. Um, I, uh, as I say, it's a new computer, so it's not actually working um, as it was. I also apologize for the somewhat groovy background music that I have uh, here. I, um, I came to a working space earlier and didn't realize that it was um, gonna become quite as groovy at uh, uh, 12.30. Right, okay, so let's uh, move on. Um, right, so first thing I'm going to say is that CCS, very important, um, but you need to improve the plants, get them up to best available technology um, before starting about CCS and thinking about using less materials and that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of decarbonisation that can be done um, before you start moving um, on to CCS. You need to <clears throat> we need to look at the golden triangle and actually do that, the golden triangle of free and very low cost um, emissions reductions, um, and you know, companies need to do that. Right, next. Um, in terms of steel, there's a I've, I've been noticing quite a lot of um, <coughs> suggestions that people should um, move entirely to hydrogen-based processes, the Hisana, um development seems to have um stopped recently which was you know the the very advanced steel making um system if you click again please i worry a bit about uh, this click please um mainly because if you do some fairly basic rough calculations you can see that just pro producing iron and steel <coughs> and not thinking about all the other uses that people have um, suggested for hydrogen, um, you're looking to approximately triple global hydrogen production. All right. Um, oh, no, go back. Uh, and I don't agree with shifting emissions from current steel producers to a nascent industry that may not ever produce hydrogen cheaply enough for all applications. I think that there is a significant um risk there that what might happen in the future is that uh, we say oh well you know uh, all the steel makers can can use hydrogen 
And then in 10, 15 years time, they say, well, hydrogen's not cheap enough. And uh, you told us that there would be free practically or very low cost hydrogen around. Um, it's not our fault, Gov. Uh, we still need to be able to um, release CO2. Next slide, please. So I think everybody should know um, this click, please. <coughs> but um, in a number of the process industries um, and cement in particular, um, there, is, there are significant issues with a large amount of the um, emissions coming from the process itself. So from the chemistry of the overall process. So here, for example, um, <coughs> the limestone going to um, uh, so calcium carbonate going to calcium oxide um, gives you about 60 percent of the overall emissions from the cement production process now what that means is that um, your you have to basically use ccs on cement um, because um, you cannot make ordinary Portland cement without releasing um, a large quantity of CO2. Um, yes, in terms of iron and steel, you can go via a hydrogen route for reduction of the um, ores, but there are intrinsic CO2 emissions, certainly in cement production. Uh, carry on, please. The other thing that's important to note is that um, for both cement and iron and steel, <coughs> If you look at the um, plot here, look at the red line, which is like the um, most <coughs> efficient plants. Um, the energy that's being used, <coughs> uh, apologies for the coughing, I, um, I had COVID last week. Um, the energy that you're using is coming down, but very, very slowly now, right? So um, there's little, possibility of doing stuff by um, uh, just improving processes etc carry on so um, I won't go through the details of the um, uh, cement plant next next what I will do here is talk about um, some of the stuff that we like to do at Imperial which is thinking about re-engineering processes and we've been doing this with Calix, a, um, a company that's just been uh, published. So if you look on the right hand side of these. Here, well, anyway, so. Hello. Right. If you look at the right hand slides of these plots, you have um, in grey the thermal energy usage, the thermal um, duty of the CCS plant. Um, and in the bottom left hand corner, and you can see that if you're careful about how you um, design, in this case, a new type of calcina for a cement plant, you can both intrinsically capture a large proportion of the CO2 emissions. If you look into the top right hand pane, that is the CO2 emissions, the grey is the unabated plant and the black, blue and red are different options for how you design this um, new type of calcina, how you operate this new type of calcina. And what you can see is that for, that you can, for a very marginal change in the energy that you put in, you can reduce, you can remove quite a large proportion of the CO2 emissions. Um, just think about how you just thinking about how you um, uh, decarbonize the system, right? Uh, I'm getting a few people unmuted. So if, if uh, somebody would like to mute everybody apart from me, that would be super useful. Right, next slide, please. Okay, so um, one thing that is important is looking at um, synergies between different ways of capturing CO2. So uh, I'm not going to go through um, the details of this, but there's, there's different ways that CO2 is emitted and different ways that CO2 can be taken up during the life cycle of cement, for example. Click many times until we're off this um, slide, please. 
And again, there we go. And oh, go back, that's it. So what you're seeing here is different ways of fueling a um, cement plant. Um, in the top left-hand pane in red, there is fueling it with coal, then there's fueling it with hydrogen or electricity. Um, and bottom left is municipal solid weight, bottom right is biomass. The um, y-axis is the emissions relative to a baseline cement plant, and the x-axis is the fraction of um, direct CO2 emissions captured, right? So the fractions of the CO2 emissions from the plant that are captured. And what you can see is two things that I'd really like you to see. First off, with hydrogen or electricity, you end up, um, you can only ever go to zero emissions at 100% capture um, of uh, the direct emissions that are there. So because you've got the um, process emissions that are emitting large amounts of CO2, you have to catch, you have to do CO2 capture on a very large amount um, in order to um, uh, go net, net zero. But more interestingly, looking at the new municipal solid waste and the biomass, you, if you go to about 0.8, um, CO2 capture for the MSW, you're close to um, uh, CO2 neutral. And if you go to 0.95, then you're significantly CO2 negative overall and biomass even more. Next slide, please. The other thing that's important is um, that um, thinking about how you capture your emissions from your calcination process, if you capture your emissions from your calcination process and don't let them mix in with the rest of your um, uh, emissions, you can then have a significantly smaller amine scrubbing plant to capture all the rest of the um, emissions, all the fuel emissions and all of this sort of stuff. So um, it turns out that there's synergies between different types of carbon capture. And for example, if you have a uh, with this direct separation reactor, this calcina that I've been um, uh, thinking about, um, your CO2 capture plant, um, a post-combustion CO2 capture plant capturing all of the remaining emissions would have to be 40% the size um, of your um, baseline plant if you just put a, 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 um, an aiming scrubbing plant on the back of your cement plant. So what this means, this is very interesting for numerous reasons, but essentially on a normal cement plant, there's only about half as much um, low grade heat available as you would need to actually drive a post combustion capture system. So what this means is that actually by putting on by re-engineering the process to remove CO2 as efficiently as possible upstream, you get your downstream CO2 emissions system um, sufficiently small that it will fit within the envelope of the heat demand, uh, sorry, the heat that is produced in the cement plant. Anyway, next slide. So what it all means is that actually when you tot up, just adding up all the different ways of decarbonizing, for example, cement, um, you can end up driving a net negative process, which is already available at massive scale and does several things, including waste disposal processes. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, I think we basically need to continue doing everything as fast as possible all at once. I haven't gone into the details of it, but it's possible to engineer out CO2 at the source or to engineer it so that the CO2 that is produced is produced um, in as concentrated a way as possible and is separatable in as um, energy efficient a way as possible. I'm worried about over-reliance on hydrogen and I'm worried about downgrading of post-combustion capture as an, uh, as an option, particularly in the iron and steel industry. Uh, not all CCS is the same thermodynamically and commercially, and there's synergies between um, advanced CCS and amine or other post-combustion um, based CCS, which isn't advanced CCS. 
Right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Paul. I think you did a lot of things in 10 minutes. First of all, you've reminded our audience that there isn't one size fits all, that the problems in industrial um, decarbonization are holistic and that we need to sort of think individually and target and targeted approach. So I have to imagine, well, we're, uh, we're gonna do a changeover in just a second to James Watt. I do wanna encourage you uh, to put some questions into the chat that we'll be starting our, just kicking off our discussions with in the second half, um, because I think there was a lot of thought provoking ideas in there. Paul's never one to shy away from saying what he thinks. And I think that's great. Um, and I'm sure there's some disagreement, but I think it's, it puts us in a great position uh, for actually starting to move the conversations forward and to understand what industry needs and how CCS can deliver that. So with that, James, are you ready to go? I don't hear him. There we go, there we go. Uh, Middle brilliant, James. Yes. Fantastic. So while James is getting his slides up, if anyone wants to put questions into the chat, I know we've got a few. Um, please don't hesitate, get your ideas off your chest and we'll get them going. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce James Watt from WSB. Okay, um, I take it everyone can see the screen. Um, um, and I, I, I'll confess, I don't quite know what an ocean has got to do with the, the CCS topic, but um, corporate IT and uh, marketing, great. Um, so I want to talk about CCS enabled industry and a little bit of a, a bugbear of mine, um, the stranded asset problem. Um, and, and put into context what CCS actually can bring to um, some of those sites. So as we've talked about, the decarbonization challenge that faces every energy user, reduce emissions, reduce energy consumption, be more sustainable, try and minimize the impact um, on your own business, otherwise there will be no business. Uh, timing is the big, big single issue um, behind a lot of this actually, and, not, and there's no real single solution. And where am I coming from in terms of industry and not just the TFIs, but all of them? The map on the right is um, my Google Earth. I, I, I still maintain Google Earth is one of the greatest engineering tools ever invented, um, particularly from a, a CCS cluster's point of view. Each one of those dots is from the UK uh, emissions database and from EU ETL. Um, prior to that, that represents an emitter of carbon dioxide above a certain threshold level. Um, they're color coordinated, and I know what the colors mean. Um, but you can just see from that map one of the critical things um, about CCS at the moment, because we're very cluster focused, is that the vast majority of emitters are outside the clusters. The clusters account for half the emissions because that's where the big boys are. but the majority of the emitters are not in the clusters. Um, so it, it's beginning to be a little bit of a problem, particularly around timing. So what fuel, what power and fuel options, typically when we're looking at a typical industrial site, what options are there? So um, whether it's industry generates its own power or takes it from the grid, if it takes it from the grid, it's the orange. Um, if it's generating its own power, um, it tends to be the, the, the black line. So um, sites that use coal as a feedstock or a process chemical or power generation, the gas, natural gas through the gas grid, um, sites using waste EFWRDF um, or biomass to generate their own power or heat, because it's not just about power, it's also about heat. Um, all flow into industry and you have on the right-hand side of the drawing, um, green, yellow, um, normal grid electricity from various sources and the nuclear, um, all feeding in. These are the, this is the status quo. So what does CCS do to industry or to this particular emitter that's been, that's being looked at? It doesn't change too much. You can still have the existing feedstocks. You can still have the existing fuels, but if you start adding CCS, you're decarbonizing your emissions, your outputs. You can loop back the CO2 to become part of your feedstocks. But the CCS, the blue boxes, enables you to switch that lower carbon path that we have to be on um, by 2050. 
um, in terms of uh, the, the biomass content of EFW and RDF and biomass, yes, that can allow sites to just slip into the negative or offset some of their other emissions um, to, to reach for that net zero goal. But CCS also enables the hydrogen um, side of the argument. As much as low carbon electricity, particularly nuclear and green electricity, produces green hydrogen, we also have the blue option. So you have bulk hydrogen, particularly in the clusters, that is only enabled by the use of CCS. What it allows industry to do is consider a lot more options than if these systems weren't here. If we relied on a non-CCS solution, um, like electricity um, and decarbonizing the network, we're talking about electrification, which is significant uplifts in spending. Some processes are not achievable by electrification alone. Um, if we go with biomass as the option for, for, for that kind of heating or biofuels, you've got the, the challenge for that market in that it's being used for power generation. There's only a finite amount of biomass that you can actually use. If you then add into the mix, hydrogen, particularly blue hydrogen, which enables CCS, it enables you to have that non-power option. Yes, we understand that hydrogen um, generated from grid electricity and from green renewables will challenge the decarbonized electricity market, but we will still have stranded assets. We will still have um, assets that could be producing the electricity is going nowhere. So generate your hydrogen that way. There's options. What CCS does is allow you those options, uh, the different options. It also critically allows the industry to remain in place. And we, we, we don't talk too much about that, but where our industries are provide value to the local economy. And there is a concern, slight one. Um, if you concentrate on the clusters, will industries migrate to the clusters, therefore disadvantaging the communities they've just left? They will have to make decisions in the 2040s, probably the mid to late 2030s, about what they're going to do um, with regard to net zero, if they're not already having those conversations. Um, but the ones outside the clusters are more challenged because no one's really looking at them um, for enabling them to um, provide um, CCS infrastructure. The drawback of the hydrogen side of things though, outside of the cluster is they're gonna to have to wait for the gas grid to be converted. That means they're waiting for the domestic users to come off. Um, they're waiting for the gas grid to wind down. It'll either be replaced with hydrogen or domestic users will switch to electricity. Either way, that's a multi-decade exercise before the gas grid goes and stops. But if they want to continue using gas, they're gonna to have to do the CCS anyway. So they, there's, they, there's a, a time, F, time issue there. And what CCS does is if you produce, put a CCS solution on, it kind of takes away some of the risks of waiting for hydrogen to happen, waiting for decarbonized electricity, chat being challenged by decarbonization, decarbonized electricity network that will have um, more flexibility, have to have more flexibility ability into it um, and potentially more um, generation challenges and waiting of course for the, the next generation of nuclear to appear to provide baseload. So the, for the remote energy or emitter users there is that challenge um, and CCS allows you to respond or gives you a third arm or third option to consider if you're waiting for hydrogen to run out if you're waiting for decarbonized electricity, it potentially gives you a, a solution that might be cheaper than decarbonized using electrification in your process plant or your um, uh, one of your TFIs. It gives you that option. Um, and at this, at this moment in time, we have to have all of them in place. Um, the challenges though, are that CCS and hydrogen both bring is timing, and the reach of the infrastructure. The same with the electricity grid, and we can't understate that enough. The electricity grid is currently designed to deliver what it delivers. Far more energy is supplied via the gas grid. So there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done, not just on generation, but also the network issues around um, electrification. So the cluster approach, 
um, is the right approach. There's there's no getting away from it. Um, industries within touching distance of of the clusters are going to be enabled. Um, what the clusters aren't doing though is stretching out and looking. I, I know of only one that's looking wider than their current footprint. Um, but it provides that common infrastructure which is needed, which would enables industry to remain um, and, and enables that value to stay um, where it's currently located. It should attract low carbon growth. If you put a, high, a, a CCS node, will you get complementary industries attaching themselves or new industries coming in? Um, and we're seeing upticks in all of the named clusters where more projects are coming in because of the access to the, the CCS and it enables therefore inward investment um, and external investment into the UK and consideration of those sites. Because at the end of the day, everyone can see the trajectory that we're going in and having to have low carbon products. So what sites, uh, options do sites have? Um, I've previously been, um, uh, John Gibbons has recently revealed that I have a CCS map on my wall, which is gradually being translated into to Google Earth. But if you take a, a, an example, cement works, everyone will look at the map and go, which one is he talking about? It's a dead one. Um, I've used an example of a site that no longer exists as, a, as an emitter. But for each individual site, these are the things they're going to have to consider. How far away are they from the access points? And this cement work has options to, to Wales, to Bacton, to Humber, to Northwest. If they got really pushed, they could probably you know, join in with a southern network. If, if you could ever get planning permission to do something like that down there. There is options. The challenge though, is the cost of that options. So CCS done properly, CCS transport done properly brings a lower cost um, uh, of transport to people, to, to industrial sites and potentially, and, and, and potentially makes it more feasible than running a, you know, a, a cement works, running a, a pipeline to Milford Haven, that, that impacts economically. But CCS done properly, like hydrogen done properly, enables much lower costs. That makes it more economical for the sites to remain and for the UK to maintain its manufacturing base um, in certain areas. And that's again, it just effectively what I've just been talking about is that the, the clusters enable the deployment, remote emitters need the infrastructure um, and it allows people to remain in place um, and we can't overstate that. We, the, the, the impact of CCS allows sites to continue. If it rolls out in the 2030s, 2040s, decisions and, and feasibility studies for that kind of work are starting to materialize now where people are going, actually, we need to remain here where our raw feedstock is in terms of quarries and um, mineral assets that enables us to remain here, that protects jobs, that protects value, that protects the economic economy um, in the local surrounds. CCS enables you to do that. Hydrogen would enable you to do that. Electrification um, potentially allows you to do that. But it's about finding the balance of which, which option it is the one that you, is, is going to get you there in time for that 2050 or in time to make the decision to deploy that technology. Um, whereas if you look at hydrogen and electrification, we don't quite know when each individual site is going to get somewhere, particularly with hydrogen, because they're not going to make a decision on domestic hydrogen um, until 2025. And that's it. I don't know if I'm over or under, Kira. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's brilliant, James. Do you know what? It was been absolutely fantastic. And um, there's been lot. There's some questions that have come through as a result of the things you've been saying. And while we're doing the changeover to uh, Matt Wilkes, I, if you have any thoughts you want to pop into the chat, as I said, we'll be using those to kick off our discussion in the second half of this um, webinar. Um, but I think, to be honest, James's presentation is going to lead perfectly into Matt's, who's going to talk about some of those system issues and talking about the energy relationship that we that industry has and how we sort of cope with, again, the cluster versus non-cluster problem. So with that, I'll stop chattering away and I will pass it to Matt, who I see is ready to go. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, it looks right. Yeah. Yep. 
Excellent. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Wilkes, a research fellow in clean energy at the University of Sheffield, and I'm also a UK CCSRC early career researcher. My supervisor is Dr. Solomon Brown, and I'm part of the Brown Research Group. And within the group, we have produced uh, technical reviews and reports, as well as developed process and economic models for a range of companies within the energy and industrial sectors. And we are seeing more and more industries investigating CCUS for energy intensive processes, such as lime, cement, iron and steel production. And we've also researched CCUS for ammonia and hydrogen production. So we have an understanding on the role CCUS is going to play in decarbonizing energy for industry. And what we've found is that emissions for industry can be separated into two main categories. We have uh, indirect energy requirement uh, or emissions that come from uh, the national grid connection. And these are for process and auxiliary power, for example, using electricity to produce steam in a kettle boiler or to drive pumps and compressors for pumping fluid around the plant. Then we have direct emissions from the on-site use of fossil fuels for direct thermal energy supply, for example, coal or natural gas combustion in cement making kilns or steel furnaces. And there was also CO2 coming directly from the process itself. So Paul Fennell touched on this. This was the decomposition of limestone in lime and cement kilns that produce CO2. And when we come to decarbonize the sources of CO2, for indirect emissions, we rely on the decarbonization of the energy grid. So this requires the use of more renewables and nuclear power generators, as well as ensuring gas, coal, uh, biomass, uh, even waste to energy, power, all of these need to have CCS or CCUS incorporated. Uh, direct emissions are a little trickier to abate and we can look at CCUS to capture CO2 on tail gases and just before release into the atmosphere. We can also use alternate process design, which produce less or zero CO2 emissions and even uh, look at energy uh, efficiency through process intensification. We can also look towards fuel switching. So I think it was Element Energy who uh, produced a report a few years ago uh, on the potential market for fuel switching in UK in industries and using electrification, i.e. electric arc furnaces or electric boilers, and by using biomass and hydrogen, we can potentially save up to 30% on the energy demand in 2040. So this is around 20 uh, megatons of CO2 per year. So we need all of these methods to ensure we hit uh, net zero targets. Now in the UK with the track one cluster plans, we can start to see real advancement in decarbonizing both of these categories. For power generation, the uh, East Coast cluster has uh, SSEs, KB hydrogen and KB3 power plants. We also have Drax's bio, uh, bioenergy CCS power plant. So they're using CCUS to decarbonize power and thus in directly decarbonize industry. Uh, on the West Coast, we have the high net cluster. Uh, so we have SR's low carbon hydrogen production plant, which will aid in directly decarbonizing industry through uh, fuel switching. Hydrogen is uh, really interesting. And I think it's going to play a very important role in reaching net zero by 2050. But the issue is at the moment, over 90% of the hydrogen is produced through fossil fuels. And currently using electrolysis, it's quite expensive, uh, even when using, quote, uh, free uh, renewable energy. But CCS can aid in the hydrogen economy. We can really start to see the cost of hydrogen drastically decrease when using CCS. Uh, figure one does consider a steep increase in the carbon tax from 2025. And this is why uh, the hydrogen economy pathway uh, from BICE in figure two relies on track one and track two clusters uh, to produce low carbon hydrogen. And by 2030, we start to see more bioenergy uh, and CCS to produce hydrogen, and the levelized cost of hydrogen there significantly decreases. Therefore, a lot of these routes available to decarbonize industry involve CCUS, but this comes with a whole host of challenges, politically, socially, economically. Uh, and what I'll be discussing today is um, 
the operational challenges. When we talk about CCUS, reliability and flexibility are mentioned quite a lot. And for decarbonizing energy for industry, we need to consider both the supply of electricity or hydrogen, as well as CO2 capture, transportation, utilization or storage. This means if we have a transient industrial plant that's not continuously operating, the CO2 capture plant also needs to behave flexibly. And so too does all of the downstream network. This leads to um, into the challenge around volume. Uh, can we produce the necessary volume of hydrogen required to decarbonization, uh, to decarbonize industry? And do we have the necessary infrastructure to transport, store, and utilize both CO2 and hydrogen? Um, and to do all of this, it's going to cost uh, a lot of money and the economics it is one of the most challenging parts of the CCUS problem. And we need to continue work in decreasing the high capital investment and ensure an acceptable rise in carbon tax without hindering industrial growth. Uh, we therefore need to continue research into low, low specific energy demand technologies and move from lab and pilot scale testing to more commercial scale. So one example is the molten carbonate fuel cells, which have the potential to capture CO2, as well as produce electrical and thermal energy. Here at the University of Sheffield, we have the Turk facility, which will hopefully soon begin testing on their uh, MCFC rig. Uh, economics is closely tied to the challenge of or oh, challenge around scalability. So CCRS plants uh, are like other industrial plants and you have economies of scale. Uh, therefore, I think a future difficult challenge is going to be small emitters. So James mentioned this, um, small emitters are decentralized and dispersed uh, sources of CO2 from industry. And on figure three, we can see uh, the different large industrial clusters uh, on the left hand side and on the right hand side, it's the spread of dispersed industrial sites that have the potential uh, for CCS. Uh, Bikes also produced an industrial decarbonisation strategy and showed the breakdown of UK industrial emitters. Uh, large clustered sites uh, mainly consisting of chemical, chemical plants and refineries. Uh, these produce over half of the UK's uh, industrial emissions, which is around 16% of the total emissions. Uh, it's an obvious start in place, uh, so targeting these clusters to decarbonise as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, but we're going to face a dis difficult challenge when it comes uh, time to concentrate all of our efforts on dispersed emitters. And one example of this is the, the Black Country cluster. Um, so I believe it was Matthew Rhodes who gave a talk about it at the UK CCRCRC's uh, summer conference. The problem there is you have a vast quantity of small emitters dispersed uh, across a large region without easy access to the sea and in heavily populated areas. And when it comes time to decarbonize small dispersed emitters, I think it's going to be uh, a three-pronged attack. Let's say you need negative emissions from BEPs and direct air capture to balance extremely difficult to abate industries. You then need CO2 capture and utilization because for large scale systems, pipeline transportation is feasible. But for decentralized systems, we need to look at other options because pipelines will be too expensive. Uh, and with the current scale of utilization pro uh, projects, they're better suited to small amounts of CO2. Thus, small emitters can utilize the CO2 on site uh, the third prong is fuel switching. So where possible using low carbon hydrogen or uh, synthetic fuels. So all of these include CCUS. Uh, so we have a lot of work ahead of us, but at least we're going uh, in the right direction. I believe these slides are going to be shared on the, the UK CCSRC's website. So I've included references in case anyone wants to read up further on decarbonizing energy for industry. So thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Matt. I think you really tied together the talks that we've had thus far. And um, I can see there's an incredible amount of discussion already going on in the chat. Please don't hesitate to put your questions and comments in the chat. I think we'll be picking up some of these really exciting discussions after a break. But before we go to a break, 
one of the our final speaker, um, Douglas Barnes, is going to talk a little bit about the role of startups and SMEs in this picture. Because as I introduced, the reality is, is that there isn't a one size fits all solution. And one of the things the UK does best is innovate. And so the role of innovators, be it where they are on that spectrum, um, is really important to finding solutions across industry uh, to really solve the problems that exist rather than trying to kind of fit a square peg or round hole, however you kind of describe that. Anyway, with that, before I embarrass myself further, um, I'm gonna pass to Douglas from C Capture, who's gonna talk about being a startup slash SME and how that can impact our trajectory as a country in transforming foundation industries with Carbon Capture. Take it away, Douglas. Uh, thank you, Kara. Um, so as you say, I'm going to give you a bit of a talk uh, this afternoon, uh, SMEs, startups, small organisations, and then the role they can play in decarbonisation. Uh, oh, hang on. Yeah. So the slide you here, this is a, a bit of a potted history of Sea Capture. Um, the company's been going since 2009. Uh, I've been working there for over 10 years now. And we have for the last few years been developing what we believe to be uh, the best technology in the world for carbon capture, low energy, aiming free, solvent based technology suitable for use in some of the hardest debate, most challenging industrial applications. Now, I'll tell you this partly as a bit of plug for the company, because why not? Um, but primarily to give you appreciation of my own background, my own perspective of where I'm coming from uh, in terms of the role that I see SMEs playing and small organisations playing in, in industrial decarbonisation. And certainly the, the sum total of my professional experience is with Sea Capture. So I submitted my PhD thesis on a, a Thursday afternoon and started working for Sea Capture the following Monday. So, so I'm re really very much been in, in the kind of startup space um, um, for my entire professional life. And to my mind, there's a number of strands, there's a number of threads um, in terms of the role that these small organizations can play. And the first most important one to my mind is the rate and the rapidity with which small organizations, startups can create and develop and generate new ideas to help tackle uh, the decarbonization problem. So the, the graph you see here, is that the trajectories which we need to see our carbon emissions take globally, not just in terms of industry, but globally, uh, if, if to have any chance of keeping uh, uh, average temperature rises to two degrees or more, two degrees or less rather, uh, above pre-industrial levels. And we've now left it so late in the day uh, that actually most of these trajectories that they're not feasible. Yeah, uh, we, we, we've really left it too late getting our act together. Um, so it's these kind of the, the much steeper, much more challenging and, and daunting trajectories which our carbon emissions are going to have to take. There's, there's another version of this graph uh, which shows us the trajectory we need to take to keep the global temperature rises to, to 1.5 degrees in line with the Paris Agreement. That's even more intimidating. And whilst it's true that all of the technologies which we need to achieve this, they already exist uh, and they could be deployed and we could actually achieve this. I think it also doesn't take a huge leap of imagination to assume that if we look back in 20 years time, 30 years time, 50 years time, uh, we will see that there will be a wide range of technologies, techniques, inventions, which we will come to rely on in terms of increasing the sustainability of our industry, increasing the sustainability of our economy in general, which haven't been thought of yet. Uh, nobody has had these ideas and it is really within that very vibrant, highly entrepreneurial, highly risk taking, risk tolerant ecosystem within startups, within spin out companies uh, that allows those kind of crazy ideas, for want of a better phrase, uh, to be developed, to be identified uh, and, and to allow people to actually run with. And it's kind of on that basis that, that my second uh, contribution that I think that, that SMEs and small organizations bring is in terms of value generation. Because we don't know what the, the truly revolutionary, the truly game-changing ideas are going to be at this stage, it's very difficult <laughs> to do crystal ball gazing. Uh, we need mechanisms and an ecosystem um, that allows us to get maximum valuation, maximum value uh, for the money we spend, whether that's direct funding from government grants, whether that's uh, through funding bodies such as the EPSRC or UK Innovate or, or, or Horizon 2020. Uh, or whether that's through highly risk tolerant capital like VCs, angel investors, and then that sort of thing, maximizing the amount of progress, maximizing the number of technologies and techniques. And, and I don't just mean uh, carbon capture in this instance, or obviously that's my arena, uh, but I'm also referring to things like energy storage, like fuel cells, like hydrogen generation, maybe even things like modular nuclear and, and fusion power and so on. And so maximizing the number of technologies we're able to interrogate and investigate and, and find out which ones are going to have a, a big impact on, on industrial decarbonization over the course of this century 
uh, is really a great strength um, to the, the small organizations uh, can bring to the table. And the final element of this, I think, is, is in terms of who's actually going to do this work. So we are going to need a lot of scientists and technologists and engineers. We're going to need a whole new generation of them, not only to develop these technologies, but to deploy them, to actually roll them out across industry. And the experience which these people can gain within a, a small organization, within an SME startup environment is, is, to my mind, absolutely unparalleled. So the picture you see here, that this is uh, some portion of the technical team at Sea Capture, and you'll notice there's an awful lot of very young faces there. And certainly, if I think back to when I started with Sea Capture, the number of jobs, the number of tasks, the number of roles which I had, there wasn't a single lecture or anything like it when I was at university. Uh, and the same goes for all the engineers and all the scientists we employ now. The, the breadth of experience, the breadth of um, things that we ask them to do and the rate at which they actually gain that experience gives them, to my mind, an absolutely fantastic foundation as they start their careers to go off. Um, to really affect and, and, and implement, uh, introduce these new technologies to industry at large, uh, which is, to, I don't think it, it's something that can be found really anywhere else. So it's a very, very brief introduction. <laughs> I've kept it quite short. Uh, I'm sure you all have your own opinions uh, in terms of where you think uh, SMEs and small organizations are really gonna play a part in this. And I, I look forward to, to hearing those in the discussion after the break. Thank you.